In this lesson, we will introduce the algebraic structure of rings. Up until now, we have studied groups which possess a single binary operation. Now we'll begin our study of rings, which are sets that naturally possess two binary operations, which we will call addition and multiplication. So a common example of a ring is a set of integers or the set of real numbers, which have these normal operations of addition and multiplication that we're very familiar with. So let's begin with our definition of a ring. A ring, capital R, is a set together with two binary operations, addition and multiplication, that satisfies the following properties. First, the set R with addition is an abelian group. So we can always assume that a ring is an abelian group under addition. And so in particular, it has an identity element, which we'll call zero. Um, it has every, in, every element has an additive inverse. So if A is an element of R, then we'll, we'll write the inverse, the additive inverse as minus A. And this is abelian. So A plus B is the same as B plus A. So a ring is an abelian group under addition. And secondly, the operation of multiplication is associative. So that is A times the quantity B times C is equal to the quantity AB times C for all elements A, B, and C in the ring. Now we cannot assume that every element has an, a multiplicative inverse. And so the, a ring is not necessarily a group under multiplication. But thirdly, the third property of a ring is that there are distributive properties that combine the two operations addition and multiplication. So the distributive laws hold in R. So for all elements A, B, and C, in R, we have that A times the sum B plus C is equal to A times B plus A times C. So we have this left distributive property and we have the right distributive property. If I have B plus C times A on the right, this would equal B times A plus C times A. So we have left and right distributive laws holding in the ring as well. 
So set R with two operations, addition and multiplication that satisfy these properties is called a ring. And a common example again is the set of integers. And they form, it's formed an abelian group under addition. Multiplication is associative and and we have the distributive laws. Further, the set of integers is actually commutative under multiplication. So this leads to the next definition. The ring R is called commutative. If multiplication is commutative. Since R is always commutative under addition, we, we call a ring commutative if it's also commutative under multiplication. And another definition so not every ring has a multiplicative identity. The ring R. is said to have an identity if there is an element which we will denote as one There's an element one in this ring with one times a equals a times one equals a for all elements a and r. So if a ring has a multiplicative identity, we say the ring is has an identity one. Now let's look at some examples of rings. First, let's look at the ring of integers. So the ring of integers is a commutative ring. since multiplication is commutative on the integers. And the set of integers has a an identity element one. And the operations are the usual addition and multiplication. Now, while the the element one is a multiplicative identity or just the identity of the integers, not every non-zero element of the integers has a multiplicative inverse. In fact, only two elements of, of the integers have a multiplicative inverse, one and negative one. So we see that the set of non-zero integers is not a group under multiplication. Again, because not every non-zero integer has a multiplicative inverse. Next, the set of integers mod n forms a ring.
This is another commutative ring. with identity one. And the operations are addition and multiplication mod n, or modular arithmetic. We're familiar with the set of rational numbers, the real numbers, and complex numbers. These are all examples of commutative rings with identity one. So the rationals, the real numbers, and the complex numbers. are commutative rings with identity one. And these rings actually have some other interesting properties. And one interesting fact about these three commutative rings is that every non-zero element of these rings has a multiplicative inverse. A commutative ring that has that property is called a field, which we'll define later. Next, let's look at an example of a ring of matrices. So let capital M sub N of Z be the set of all n by n matrices with integer entries. Then for example, the set of two by two matrices with integer entries, M sub two of Z is a non-commutative ring because matrix multiplication is not commutative. This is our first example of a non-commutative ring, but it still has identity which is the standard identity matrix 1001. Zero, zero, we can actually build a ring from a given ring by looking at the set of polynomials with coefficients in a particular ring R. So that's the next example. Let R be a ring with identity one. Then the set R of X This set denotes the set of all polynomials in the variable X with coefficients in the ring R.
So this set is a commutative ring with identity. And the identity function is the function f of x equals the identity one of the ring r. And we apply the same op the normal operations of polynomial addition and polynomial multiplication. So far, all of our examples of rings had an identity. This next example shows that not every ring has an identity. So the set of even integers, 2z, is a ring without an identity. Under the usual addition and multiplication, so we know that when you add two even integers, you get an even integer, and when you multiply two even integers, you get an even integer. So this set of even integers does form a ring, and there is no identity element. Since this is a subset of the integers, the identity would have to be the integer one, which is not an even integer. So from all these examples, we see that a ring can be commutative under multiplication or not commutative under multiplication. And a general ring doesn't even necessarily have to have a multiplicative identity. And further, rings may or may not have elements that have multiplicative inverses. So now I'll give a definition of a field, which is one of the most important examples of a ring. A ring R with identity one where one does not equal zero This ring is called a division ring. If every non-zero element A and R has a multiplicative inverse. That is, there exists an element B in R such that A times B equals B times A equals one. So in general, a ring is called a division ring if every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. If further, if this ring is commutative, then we call this division ring a field. So a commutative division ring 
is called a field. So some common examples of fields, as I mentioned earlier, a set of rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers are examples of fields. Because every non-zero element of these sets has a multiplicative inverse, and these are commutative rings. Next, we present some basic arithmetic properties of rings. And these will, will seem familiar from properties of integers, but these actually hold for arbitrary rings R. So let R be a ring. And let A and B be elements of R. First, 0 times A equals A times 0, which e equals 0. Second, negative A is what we, how we denote the additive inverse of A. And so since R is an abelian group under addition, every element A in R has an additive inverse negative A. So if I take negative A times B, this will equal the same as A times negative B, the additive inverse B, and these both equal the negative of the element A times B. Again, where negative A denotes the additive inverse of A. Third property, negative A times negative B equals A times B. Fourthly, if R has an identity one, then the identity is unique. And then negative A equals negative one times A. Again, where negative A is the additive inverse of A and negative one would be the additive inverse of the identity of one. Let's begin the proofs of these statements. To prove these statements, we're gonna use the distributive property. So zero times a, which is equal to zero plus zero times a, then by the distributive property, this equals zero times a plus zero times a. And then I can add the additive inverse of zero a to both sides. So adding the negative of 0a to both sides. Gives 0 equals 0 times a. And then in like fashion, we could show that a times zero must equal zero. So this first property just follows from this derivative property. For the proof of the second property, let's begin by looking at the quantity AB 
plus negative a b. By the distributive property, I can combine this to a plus negative a, the quantity, times b, but a plus its additive inverse just equals the identity zero. So this is zero b, and by property one, this just equals zero. So then I can add negative of a b to both sides. gives negative a b equals the negative of a b. And then likewise we could show that a times negative b also equals the negative of a b. property three, let's begin with zero. Zero equals zero times negative b. Then I can write zero as a plus negative a times negative b. And then by the distributive property, this equals a times negative b plus negative a times negative b. And then by property two, a times negative b equals the negative of a b. So this equals the negative a b plus negative a times negative b. And then by adding a b to both sides, we obtain the desired result. Adding a b to both sides. Gives a b equals negative a times negative b. And finally the fourth property. Suppose r has identity one. And let's suppose E is also an identity. So to show that one is unique, we need to show that E equals one. Well then, if I begin with the identity one, if I multiply the identity one by E, I should get one. So this equals E times one, because E is an identity. But since one is an identity, E times one will just equal E. So therefore, one equals E. So that's the identity one is unique. Now by two, by property two above, negative one times a equals the negative of one times a. But since one is the identity, one times a just equals a. So this equals negative a. So this finishes the theorem about these arithmetic properties of negatives in an arbitrary ring R. So the previous theorem shows that addition and multiplication behave in a familiar way for arbitrary rings However, there are properties of familiar rings like the integers 
that do not always hold for a general ring. So for example, not all rings have the zero product property. That is that if there may be non-zero elements A and B in a ring such that A, B, A times B equals zero, so this never happens in the set of integers or the set of real numbers. And further, rings may have elements with multiplicative inverses. So unlike the integers, which only has two elements with, with multiplicative inverses, some rings have multiplicative inverses for their elements. So this leads to the following two definitions. Let R be a ring. And a non-zero element A of ring R is called a zero divisor if there is a non-zero element B in R such that either A times B equals zero or B times A equals zero. And our second definition is of a unit. So we're going to assume that R has an identity one. Which is non-zero. Then an element U of R it's called a unit in R if there is some V in R so that the U V equals v u equals the identity one. So the units in a ring R are the elements with multiplicative inverses and the set of units in R is denoted by R with uh, multiplication symbol in the exponent. So let's look at some examples of zero divisors and units for the familiar ring Z of integers. This ring has no zero divisors. And any subset of the complex numbers would not have any zero divisors because these sets have the zero product property. So the set of integers has no zero divisors and the only units are the integers one and negative one. So the set of units in Z is a set containing only plus or minus one. Now the set of rational numbers again has no zero divisors. But 
since the set of rationals is a field, every non-zero element of the rationals is a unit. For any field, the set of units is equal to the ring minus zero. So in fact, a field is a commutative ring call it capital F with identity one not equal to zero in which every non-zero element is a unit. So the set of units is the field minus zero. Now another fact about units and zero divisors that in any ring R, an element of a ring R cannot be both a unit and a zero divisor. So to see this, maybe less obvious than the previous fact, that let's let A be a unit. And R. And suppose we have an equation AB equals zero for some element B and R. I'm going to show that the only way this is true is if B is zero. So therefore, A cannot be a zero divisor. Well, since A is a unit, then we know that V times A equals one for some element V in R. Then B, which equals one times B, but I can rewrite one as V times A, and then this equals V times AB, but AB equals zero. So we have V times zero, which is zero. So this shows that the only way a times b could equal zero is if b equals zero. So a cannot be a zero divisor. Now, let a be a zero divisor. And let's suppose that b a equals zero for some non-zero element B.
Now let's suppose that we have a times v equals one for some element v in R. Then b equals b times one, but one is a times v, so I can write this as b times a v. And then I can write this as b times a times v. And we know that b times a is zero. So this is zero times v, which is zero. But that shows that b is zero, and I assume that b was not zero. So this is a contradiction. So thus, if a is a zero divisor, it cannot be a unit. And similarly, if a is a unit, it cannot be a zero divisor. So no element in a, of a ring can be both a unit and a zero divisor. Now let's look more closely at the ring of integers mod n. So for n greater than or equal to two, let's look at the units of the set of integers mod n. Well, the units, that those elements in the set of integers mod n that have a multipli multiplicative inverse correspond to the elements of the integers mod n that are relatively prime to n. So the units are the elements that are relatively prime to n. So this is the same notation we used in in uh, when we studied group theory. So the set of units in the integers mod n is a set of residues a, where a and n are relatively prime. So the GCD of a and n equals one. So we now we know what the units look like in the set of integers mod n. Now, on the other hand, let's assume that a and n are not relatively prime. So if a is an element of the integers mod n, and the GCD of a and n is let's say d which is greater than one then a is actually a zero divisor of this ring so to see this let's let b equal n divided by d. Then since d is greater than one, n over d has to be less than n, but since n is positive, b is also positive. So we have b is between zero and n, and therefore we can write B as one of the residue classes of the integers mod n. And we see that n divides a b. So therefore, a times b will be congruent to zero mod n. 
So if a is relatively prime to n, then we can find a b such that a times b is congruent to zero mod n, and we see that therefore a is a zero divisor of the integers mod n. So to summarize all this, we have the following fact. Every element, every non-zero element of the integers mod n is either a unit or a zero divisor But now consider the case when the modulus is prime. So when n is prime, then all of the re all of the non-zero residues in the, the integers mod n would be relatively prime to n. So we see that if n is prime, then every non-zero element is a unit. And so this leads to this next fact that the set of integers mod n is a field, which again is a commutative ring with identity where every non-zero element is a unit. And so we see that this set is a field if and only if n is prime. Again, this follows from what we did above but using the fact that n is prime, we see that all of the elements, one, two, three, all the way up to n minus one would be relatively prime to n. And so therefore they would be units. And that forces the integers mod n to be a field.